web slinging, radioactive spiders, rooftops, and a great comic book legacy, welcome to the Spider-Man series. For over 30 years has the friendly neighborhood Spider-Man graced the world of gaming. Some of its games are applauded as the epitome of open world adventures, while others have polarized critics. Nonetheless, the brand of Spider-Man has indeed left an impression on the gaming consciousness, and with the impending release of the latest entry in 2018, I thought I'd give a brief recap of the series up to this point. The story begins in 1962, when Stan Lee wanted to create a character that could identify with a teenage audience. Inspired by magazines and films revolving around spiders, the superhero Spider-Man was born. And of course, its inception was received with both positive reception and brand recognition. However, the first Spider-Man video game wouldn't be released until all the way in 1982 for the Atari 2600. Since then, the superhero would appear from time to time, appearing in various different consoles, handhelds, and arcade games. However, popularity and appeal rose like never before once the fifth generation of consoles arrived. Specifically with the PS1 and the N64, we enter the title known simply as Spider-Man 2000. Developed by Neversoft, this installment would be the first 3D entry for our favorite web slinger, and can be largely seen as the grandfather for all the rest of the series moving forward. The game was applauded for its presentation. Not only was Stan Lee narrating for the title, Peter Parker's alter ego, the amazing Spider-Man, but it was one of the first superhero games that made an excellent transition into 3D. The plot follows Peter Parker on his quest to stop Doc Ock and later Carnage from destroying New York City. Naturally, due to both the popularity and success of this entry, that a sequel was made, known as Enter Electro. However, this game was received with a bit of mixed response. Unlike the previous entry, Enter Electro was developed by a new studio known as Vicarious Visions. Despite being a sequel, this one didn't change much from its previous installment. Structurally speaking, Enter Electro is nearly identical to its predecessor. Despite this, many still have fond memories regarding this title. Moving forward, both Spider-Man 2000 and Enter Electro would act as a foundation of sorts to many future titles. This is where we enter with the Raimi films. The Sam Raimi films are largely positively received, well, mostly, but they did leave behind some interesting titles known as the trilogy of Spider-Man movie games. Back when Spider-Man 1 and 2 hit the theaters, it seemed like that's what everybody was talking about at the time. It was everywhere. People were cosplaying as Spider-Man, merch was going around like wildfire. Spider-Man appeared to be on top of the world in those days, but what really turned into a time sink for many were the Spider-Man games that accompanied the films. Beginning with Spider-Man 1, developed by Treyarch, many applauded the open world sections, in addition with the comical yet somewhat satisfying mechanic of how Spider-Man could seemingly web-sling from the sky. What many found appealing about this installment is that it largely built on concepts found in previous games, such as 2000 and Enter Electro. But it did expand on this formula. In fact, many web abilities found in these titles crossed over into here. Gone were the days of only being able to web-sling twice before tiring out. Plus, the entry introduced more in-depth combos. And you can unlock more of them by finding some of these Golden Spider tokens throughout the levels. Overall, the gameplay is fairly solid, though fair arguments can be made against the stealth levels. The highlight for many still remained the open world segments for this entry. And luckily enough, this concept was further expanded on in the sequel, Spider-Man 2. And as fate would have it, as soon as this game was released, many applauded it for its open world. Looking at it now, it can be seen why. Web slinging, for one, saw a massive improvement, taking on a more momentum-based approach as opposed to the static format we saw in earlier entries. Additionally, you could actually explore on the ground. These inclusions alone actually turned some heads back in the day. However, what sold many was how this title integrated its open world with the feeling of a Spider-Man universe. Speaking about its gameplay, the game did divide itself between open world segments and linear levels. A bit of a bold move, but it worked out fairly well. The linear segments are largely well crafted, feeling like a nod to some of the earlier games which were more on the linear side of things. In terms of the open world, you can go after many side quests such as dealing with crime or returning some random child's balloon. Doing so nets you points in which you can exchange for upgrades. Naturally, this point exchange cycle incentivizes players to seek out points by any means, whether it be delivering pizzas, collecting tokens, or completing races. Another thing I like about this game, there's a lot of options. Moving on to story, like its predecessor, it's based on the film of the same name, but it does take its liberties to make itself stand out. Including plot lines and characters that do add to the overall package, many adore the inclusion of Black Cat and Origin to this end. 
And this brings up another point, this game feels more fleshed out when it decides to distance itself from the film. So talking more about the graphical side of things, the first game actually appears better in some areas. In fact, I did a little comparison test here to see if that would be the case, and honestly some of the in-game models in the first game look a bit sharper than they did in the sequel. Sure, the game is aged graphically, there are some texture pop-ins, but I'm willing to let it slide since the game overall is quite fun. The voice acting is okay, kind of, Toby and Kirsten Dunst could use a little bit more emotion, and the NPC voicing just sounds off. However, the soundtrack is pretty great and fits the bill in a lot of set pieces. In summary, what really drew players to Spider-Man 2 is how well it meshed its open world along with the physics engine. Again, this game really improved the web-slinging by incorporating momentum-based movement, and honestly, it feels great. Another way to describe Spider-Man 2 is it's like a superhero Grand Theft Auto. Obviously, there's a lot of differences between Spider-Man and Grand Theft Auto, but the meaning lay on not only the open world, but how Spider-Man handles in the game. So naturally, as time went on, this title in particular would hold a special place in the minds of many. In fact, many are looking forward to a future Spider-Man entry that would be a successor to this title. Many of the Spider-Man installments that would come after this game would either take this formula in a new direction, or take certain deviations from it. For example, the next mainline Spider-Man game that would come out would be Ultimate Spider-Man, definitely in the upper tier of the series. Unlike the games based off the Raimi films, this entry is based off the comic of the same name, with the writer Brian Michael Bendis contributing to the title. What really pops out for this entry at first glance is its graphical presentation, taking a more comic book orientation than its predecessors. In terms of the gameplay, it's fairly unique with its implementation of Venom, and yet you can play as Venom this time around, and he can pretty much kill everything. And I mean everything. In terms of controls, Ultimate took some deviations from Spider-Man 2, especially when it came to web-slinging and combat. In the former, many found it a bit odd to see how web-slinging was altered when it was seemingly so on point in the previous installment. Same can be said for the combat system, which is serviceable, watered down some would describe it. The dodge mechanic was removed, which some have argued slows down the flow of combat. And the web abilities within combat is pretty much regulated to just tying up some goons after they've been knocked out. Additionally, some races get a bit on the tedious side. But aside from all this, the overall game is enjoyable. There's a lot of fun to be had here. Moving on in our journey, we'll take a quicker view of the series going forward. Let's tackle Spider-Man 3, the last of the Raimi game trilogy. And wow, this entry is pretty much polarized by the community. You either enjoyed it, or you downright hated it. Nevertheless, many of the side missions are fairly enjoyable. However, everything else is adequate. Yeah, adequate is probably the word I would use to describe this one. First off, the web-slinging is serviceable, but a bit slower and heavier than what it used to be. Again, not sure why the web-slinging was changed right after Spider-Man 2 when it was so fluid then. In terms of the combat, it feels a bit jarring. Many of the bosses aren't really challenging, and many encounters are devolving into just button mashing into the next screen. Additionally, many of the character models looks like something somebody dished out in Gary's mod. Leaving the Raimi films behind, we head over to Friend or Foe. Now before anything, I don't really want to compare this game to the others in the series since it's so drastically different from the previous installments. Developed by Next Level, Friend or Foe, in terms of presentation, is like a Saturday morning cartoon, filled with over-the-top set pieces. The gameplay can be characterized as a basic beat-em-up that's very linear. The gameplay can be very repetitive in this light. However, I have heard that this game was developed for a younger crowd, and with that in mind, there is some enjoyment to be had here, and you can play as other heroes like Blade or even villains. But again, I'd like to be careful in comparing this title to others in the series, as this game was probably marketed towards a different demographic altogether. I'm not sure that I'd recommend this game to others as an entry or even an intermediate level Spider-Man game, but if you find enjoyment in this one, go for it. Now let's head on over to Web of Shadows. Ironically enough, I want to say that Web of Shadows is one of the darker games in the series. Now what many found appealing in this entry, by far, is the combat system, and god they were creative with this one. Spider-Man can get downright disgusting when it comes to the combos in this game. Developed by Shabba Games, along with a returning Treyarch, this game features an apocalyptic New York City where citizens are being infected by a symbiote outbreak. Looking back at this, I have to applaud its camera controls that it doesn't impede on the flow of combat. Now it does get hectic at times, but it doesn't get too over the top. The major complaint here is the lack of traditional side quests. However, the title makes up for it with roaming enemies across the city, along with the occasional side mission. One thing that should be said is that this game really tried to innovate the combat system. 
The story has Spider-Man utilizing his standard red suit, or the symbiote black, which has an effect on the game's plot. One of this entry's main highlights, I think, is the symbiote Wolverine boss fight, which I have to say I remembered enjoying very much. I suppose it's time now to get unorthodox, enter Spider-Man Shattered Dimensions, developed by Beanox. This game is divided into four sections between four different Spider-Men, the Amazing, Noir, 2099, and the Ultimate versions. Like friend or foe, this entry is not an open-world Spider-Man game, and as such, the title is more on the linear side. Personally, for me, the highlight are the noir levels, which are very atmospheric. Honestly, I wouldn't mind seeing an entire game based in this style. Also, the Deadpool segments are a sight to behold. And moving on to the sequel, Edge of Time largely followed in this formula. While these games do have mixed opinions, Edge of Time is largely seen as the black sheep to this end. So now we enter the Amazing series. With the passing of the Raimi films, many look to the new reboot with an apprehension and hope. Same can be said for the accompanying games. Developed by a returning Beanox, the Amazing Spider-Man, like the Raimi games, were loosely built off the films. The combat system and side missions I'm commending to be fairly enjoyable. I like the camera sections, and I also liked how you could make the markers to your next destination while web-slinging. It was a neat little touch. Graphically, the game looks pretty good, and I actually kind of like how the camera is close to you this time around. It makes me appreciate the Spider-Man animations a bit more. I've heard people compare this game to Batman Arkham Asylum, which I can certainly see while looking at the combat. However, I like Spider-Man's more agile twist on it. This game shines best in the sandbox rather than in the linear sections. With this being said, let's discuss the title's sequel, The Amazing Spider-Man 2. And wow, I have to say this entry received the most negative reception so far when it came to the series. If you read anything about this game, you'll find out that there's a lot of bugs and glitches throughout the title, but what about the rest of the game? Well, the gameplay and the story, kind of like the movie, leaves a lot to be desired. The hero menace mechanic found in the side missions is a source of criticism for its poor implementation. And additionally, boss battles are really anticlimactic, supported by quick time events. My favorite. And then wrap it all up with a lifeless city, and yeah, this is just not a very good one. So with that said, what I'd say is the biggest flaw for Amazing Spider-Man 2 is its lost potential. There's glimmerings of a good game in here, but with more time and effort, maybe we could have all been singing a different tone on this one. With all that being said and done, the Spider-Man game series certainly has seen its ups and downs. However, there is hope for the future. The latest Spider-Man has been revealed at E3 2017, showing promise of innovating the gameplay of Spider-Man, incorporating elements of the open world into a much larger scheme, and honestly, I'm really excited. I mean, this game just looks awesome. The graphics look amazing, but it all depends on what the gameplay is going to be like. Will it be another Spider-Man 2, or is it all just hype? Spider-Man is one of my favorite superhero series, and I'm really excited for this next PlayStation 4 game, so hopefully it's gonna be good.